Oh, guys, it's so good to be with you uh, today. We're going to be talking leadership and ministry and calling on your life and what vision, finances, you name it. We'll do a, a number of talks here that people are going to get to hear over the course of time. Um, but let's dive in. Let's, we're going to start with calling, okay? But let's, before we can get there, um, God never calls you first to something before he first calls you to himself, okay? Yeah, so can we just start there? I got Pastor Nate, I got Pastor Brad, Pastor Jeff, Pastor Angelo. Yeah. And uh, you, you want me to start, who, who you want me to start with? Now with you? Don't, don't pick me first. Okay. <laughs> it's up to you. But, hey, you're right here. You're on my right here. Yeah. You see, see at the right hand right here, okay? That's, <laughs> that's like biblical right there. So Pastor Brad, uh, tell me how you came to the faith and how yeah. you got to kind of where you are today, you know, the beginning of the journey. Yeah, I, um, I am third generation uh, minister in the Assemblies of God. Okay. Um, my parents and your grandparents, Pastor Jeff's parents, are best of friends. Yeah. They, we grew up holidays together and hanging out together, um, just go way back. But you still got to have that experience with Jesus. Yeah. And um, I'm a big sports guy. So um, throughout my life, I played basketball in high school and college. There we go. Always kind of envisioned that uh, I would coach, uh, teach a history class in high school and then coach the high school basketball team. Oh. But my senior year in high school, I was coming back from a Jesus festival. They used to bring in these big uh, names down in Orlando, Florida, 20,000 kids. During that whole week, um, I really never heard anything from the Lord except on the way home about midnight. In fact, earlier that day, I had just been told by my dad, hey, the Detroit Free Press uh, made you honorable mention All-State in basketball. Wow. And I had had a couple of offers, smaller schools, to play uh, college basketball. And about midnight, driving back from that festival, uh, David, I really felt like the Spirit of God just dealt with my heart. I don't want you to coach or teach. I want you to coach people mm -hmm. spiritually. And I'm going to have you preach God's word. And for me, that was big because I liked playing ball in front of people. I didn't like talking in front of people. Wow. So every Sunday I get up to preach, I got to tell you, yeah. that's, <laughs> I, that's renewing the call for my yeah. life. That's amazing. Yeah. I think you can resonate a little bit. I don't know a lot of your story, but uh, people listening, I think, can resonate. The idea of having a coach in your life is huge. So how did you come to the faith and how did you come into your calling with that coaching? Yeah, I just, I, I grew up with a really rough relationship with my dad, you know, um, so I was extremely rebellious, um, fought against all kinds of authority figures. I mean, all kinds of authority figures. I actually beat my baseball coach up in the dugout. <laughs> <laughs> and when you beat your baseball coach up, that, means you're, you? that means you're uncoachable. How you? old were you? I was about 13 or 14. <laughs> yeah. that, that I mean, Angelo, I stuck and hurt too. your playing time. I stuck him out, you know. I put my shoulder in his ribcage. I beat up the cage. coach's son. <laughs> I beat up the coach, you know, and then I got caught up in the party scene and, and yeah. maybe five, six years of that. And, and then in March of 86, I had this incredible encounter with Christ and uh, he delivered me from that, that party scene. And how old were you? I was 20. 20. You know, but my greatest miracle isn't so much that he delivered me from the party scene. Um, to me, the greatest miracle is that he made this uncoachable kid coachable. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. awesome. And then how, how, how many years later were you called to ministry, kind of what you're doing now to some degree? Uh, I say about four years later, okay. you know, I kind of had the impression in my heart. I knew God had kind of called me, but, you know, just didn't have the confidence and, and the, the willpower and none of that. And my wife and uh, my father-in-law, who became one of my mentors, and then my youth pastor, who uh, him and I weren't necessarily on the same page in a lot of areas. He was more of the intellectual. I was more of the intense evangelistic kind of a guy. So we didn't see eye to eye on a lot of things. I didn't think he really believed in me. But when he spoke into my life and said, I, I think you need to consider this, yeah. that was the, like the final confirmation to get me to go for it. That's all. It's crazy. It's so cool because uh, you went from being uncoachable, not to just coachable, but being a coach. You went from beating up coaches Ooh. to now <laughs> teaching people how to be coaches. And now, now people are beating up this coach. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 You're the coach getting beat up. Yeah, exactly. He talked about the rebellious streak. So, you, so third generation. Yeah. Uh, PK, pastor's kid, pastor's kid, mm -hmm. but you know, you had your journey. He talked about the rebellious streak and you kind of, you didn't just run away to just run into sin to run into sin. You were wanting to run from God to some mm -hmm. degree because you knew he had something on your life. Yeah. I, I didn't really go through the rebellious stage. Um, I just love sin. And uh, I was called uh, in my early teens, I felt 
to ministry. But then when I got to college and it was Bible college, I got into sin. I enjoyed yeah. sin and, and it wasn't really rebellious. Again, sin is rebellion, yeah. but uh, I wasn't rebellious against authority, nothing like that. But, um, you know, I, I got out of speech class my freshman year and my professor said, if you ever graduate from you know, this university that you're at, please don't tell nobody because you stink. <laughs> and, um, and so I went to, uh, the phone or the phone booth, you know, remember the, remember the phone booth <laughs> back in the day, Superman. And, uh, went to the phone booth, called dad up and I said, dad, I'm, I'm quitting the university. And he said, Hey, you're welcome home, but the door is going to be locked and you're not welcomed in this house. And, uh, that really, prompted me to stay with the stuff. So I graduated from the university, but during that time I got really involved in a lot of sin and um, um, just totally got away from God. When I graduated by that point, I rededicated my life to Jesus. Did not want to go into the ministry because I was third generation. I didn't want to do what my uncles, my aunts, my, you know, everybody, everybody in my family was in ministry. So I went to the fish boats in Cape Hatteras, North Carolina, to make a lot of money. Yeah. And long story short, um, God shut every avenue down, and I came back crawling on my knees to the Lord. Went to my youth pastor, and I said, um, I just want to do anything and anything I can for you. And he said, well, I don't have a junior high ministry. And so there's seven junior high girls um, that need to be ministered to. So that was my <clears throat> that was my first congregation. Wow! And uh, and then uh, about a year and a half after that, got into youth ministry, and I, I've never looked back. That is that was my. I knew that I knew that I knew that I was called. Yeah. Of the Lord. That's that's incredible, Pastor Nate. How about you? Well, I was brought up in a uh, blended family, so all my brothers and sisters were half brothers and sisters. Mm. We didn't go to church much. Maybe my grandparents took us to a you know, a mainline church every now and then or vacation Bible school. Um, but my uh, older brothers got saved hmm. and a uh, real change in their life. Like they were partying and fighting and doing all this and they got saved. And then, and I told them, you guys are, you guys are wrecking our reputation. <laughs> we weren't beating up coaches, but <laughs> we had, we had a, our share of, uh, uh, fun and trouble, but uh, they just kept working on me. And one day, my I was out late partying. It was about two, three in the morning, and I remember my brother Steve told me that there was a church picnic at the little United Brethren Church outside of town where they went. And I didn't want to go. Got to bed, like door flew open at nine o'clock. He said, "We're going to the picnic." I said, "I'm not going. Get out of my room." Yeah. He threw me out of bed physically. And told me if I wasn't in his truck in 10 minutes, he'd beat me senseless. <laughs> <laughs> That's how we communicated. That was our love language. So I knew he would. So I got in the truck. And uh, that day out at that picnic in that park, I, gave, I walked forward and knelt at an old railroad tie in a county park and gave my life to Christ. Wow. I had no idea what awesome. was I was getting into. That's, That's incredible. Awesome, okay, so how old were you? 16. You're 16. Okay, when did you feel like a stirring that call from the Lord towards ministry? <clears throat> So a month after I got saved in September in the United Brethren Church, you vote on the youth leader, and they voted me in as their youth leader. <laughs> and so I began to lead the youth group, and I didn't even know what that meant. I was still chewing tobacco and swearing, and I mean, I wasn't, I was trying to get sanctified. I didn't know what any of that meant. I didn't know what was going on. But um, somebody recognized some leadership in me and said, you ought to be a pastor, and I began to wow. pray about that. I had some other opportunities with wrestling and stuff, and... Just um, had a counselor in high school that was a board member at the Assembly of God Church in Adrian. Mm -hmm. And I went down and I said, I feel all this. He goes, well, you had to pray about that. So I was praying about what to do with my life. I didn't know what being a pastor meant. All I knew is like the pastor at the church I had and the church my grandparents went. Neither one of those looked that awesome. So, uh, but I went to bed one night. I had a first time I ever had a real experience with God other than salvation uh -huh. where I had a vision of me preaching in a church with a really high ceiling and uh and it was full and wow. I cool. got up and went and told my counselor and he's like you had a vision god wants you to preach we got to find you a college and uh it started from there and then i realized it's our first sunday at the church that we built in bedford that as i was standing there talking i almost lost it i got choked up that was wow 
I had a revelation. That was the place wow. that I had a vision when nice. I was 17. Man, that's wow. awesome. That is, that's in- awesome. that is incredible. There ain't many counselors like that anymore. No, no. <laughs> For real. Like as, I, as I'm sitting here with y'all, it's just like, you know, I, I'm, I'm reflecting on my own story. I'm hearing your story. I'm sure so many listening, they're thinking about their story. Sure. There could be some people sitting there like, where you talk about where you were, that's where I am now. Mm-hmm. And somebody believed in you. Uh, you know, we're praying. We, we, before we start, we were praying together. Just, I believe that God's going to send somebody to those people to coach them, to believe in them, a counselor, a, you know, a, a, uh, um, a youth pastor they don't align with, whoever it is. Um, but I want to I want to springboard off that vision. Can we? Uh, you have this vision, and there's this ceiling. I think one of my favorite phrases. I don't even know who coined it, but that you know, our ro- our roof, our ceiling would become the floor of the next people that we're leading. And really that's what you guys had people in your life that raised the roof for you so that you could stand on that floor in some way. So tell me, you see this high ceiling. Um, how did it, how did it all develop getting there? You know, like you, you planted, you said in the town of Bedford, you know, you planted the church. Is that the story? You planted the church. What was some of the journey to plant? Why did you choose to plant? How did it come about? Like what led you to the city? And then eventually I want to talk about the calling of getting there, but just give me a little bit of context of where you're at now and how you got there. Well, college once, I remember some red haired preacher from some city came in and talked about church pioneering is what they used to call church planning. Yeah. And I remember responding to the altar call and saying, you know, I'll, I'll pioneer church. I'll start from scratch somewhere. Mm-hmm. Didn't know what that meant. Became a youth pastor at a couple different churches. When we were in Indiana, I wanted to plant a church. Went through the, you know, talked to my pastor, applied. The Indiana district never got back to me. And uh, then another pastor called me to be his youth pastor. So I went there. They said I didn't have enough experience to plant. So after youth pastoring for four more years, just really feeling that gnawing that I'm supposed to go start somewhere. And I was preaching on a Sunday night, and we had these balconies at at the church in Northville there, and they were kind of shadowy. The church planning director was sitting back there. I didn't see him. It was Hugh Duncan. Hugh Duncan, yeah. And he's sitting back there, so I I just preached. You know, Pastor O was gone or something, and then he came up, and he's like, got a question. I'm probably going to get in trouble for asking you this, but (laughs) have you ever thought about planning a church? Wow. And I'm like, actually quite a bit lately. And I felt that's what I've been supposed to do a long time. And from there, he gave us five communities in Michigan. And I'm familiar with Bedford Township, which is the city of Temperance in Lambertville, um, because of their wrestling program, actually. But also my mom lived just outside of there uh, when my folks divorced and she moved there. So we ended up going to Bedford and literally just knocking on doors and starting the church in our living room and... Wow. So you started right there in your house. Yeah, we and moved to Bedford. How many people did you start with? Eight. Eight people. Well, a couple from Northville went with us, so we had four. Okay. And then through a classified ad and knocking on doors, we got eight at our first meeting. Wow. Yeah. And now you've grown to where are you at now? Pre-COVID. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, like a weekly. About a thousand weekly with a thousand campuses people. and three services, nine hundred to a thousand. That's a God story, man. Yeah, yeah. that's pre-COVID. Yeah, pre-COVID. <laughs> now, lucky to get a hundred. Stinks. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> now we're reaching more. Now we're we're reaching people yeah. online. We're pe- yeah. reaching people in person. Views galore. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's amazing. Okay, so uh, did you plant or did you like possess a church? Take one. Yeah, uh, David, we planted. But it was, uh, it was, there was a core of people that was meeting with an Assemblies of God minister that was on staff with my dad. His name was David Idarak. He looked like the crazy professor from <laughs> Jerry Lewis days, yeah. and smartest yeah. man I've ever met. Wow. And he was meeting with this core of people in Brighton. Brighton had a, a terrible reputation as far as the Assemblies of God. Back in the eight, mid-80s, uh, there was somebody giving a message in tongues. And it's an Assemblies of God church, so you're, you're thinking that everybody's aligned with your belief system. Yeah. The, the pastor stopped the lady that was giving the message in tongues. He said, lady, we're not going to have that anymore at our church, this pastor, Assemblies of God pastor. Within seven days, he had taken the church out of the Assemblies of God. And for the next 17 years, there were starts and stops 
of an Assemblies of God church. Hmm. Uh, they would send a guy out to Brighton and he would last six months. I, it, what is ironic is um, the uh, summer of 1981, I'm between my freshman and sophomore year in Bible college and Brightmore, our home church, went out to Brighton and I was going door to door in Brighton passing out literature and they were planting a guy to, uh, to start a church in Brighton. Well, they planted, he lasted six months. After six months, he's like, I'm out of here. And the Assemblies of God had a terrible reputation uh, in that community, but there were about three or four families older couples, like average age of 75, that were praying, Lord, please start an Assemblies of God Pentecostal church in Brighton. And uh, that mentor, David Itarak, was meeting with these three or four people. I was getting done with my seminary degree. And he said, Brad, come on up here and see if uh, God would speak to you about pastoring. I think this could turn into a church. So there was a core of people. We went there and... Uh, after graduating, and um, I was still single. I was dating a girl that became my wife. And some people say, well, isn't it kind of odd you're dating a girl? When you're starting a church, they just want warm bodies. <laughs> you know, I, we put together a brochure. I was going to say, say your, your father, Pastor Jeff, put together a brochure. I had so few people, he had to cut and paste, yeah, I cut and paste. into the brochure <laughs> to make it look like there was more people. I remember Lord, that. forgive me for that exaggeration. <laughs> but I didn't try, try to, to start somewhere, it. man. You got it. You got it. People attract people. Right. And, uh, you know, we just started renting a, a building, you know what, in the fall of 92. And um, been there, it's, it'll be 28 years this fall. Wow. Uh, that wow. uh, awesome. God's been faithful. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, we used to tell everybody, drive both cars to church. Yeah. If you got two cars, drive them both. <laughs> <laughs> the community will think there are more people there exactly. than there really is. That's uh, hilarious. I do remember that. Your dad cutting in. I was just thinking about he that. He took some snapshots and he cut some people in uh, to make it look like there was, yeah. instead of instead of five people, it looked like there was 10 people. Oh, <laughs> we, we doubled our size. It's old school evangelism right there. You there you go, baby. Cool Photoshop. So, okay, so yeah. your story, though, is a little bit different than theirs. You came to a church and... It was already an established work, mm -hmm. but let me just hear your opinion for a second. Not against these guys, but is it easier to plant a church or to take an established church? And then tell me your story and tell me why you would say this. I believe it's easier to plant a church. Um, Let's hear opinions quickly. Based, based on friends that I know have taken established churches, I think, I, I think it's easier to plant a church. Okay, mm -hmm. okay, continue. Yeah. Uh, I was told I was given great advice to do that, and I didn't take the advice before I came here. But uh, yeah, I came here. Uh, it was a uh, work that's been here for 50 years, struggling work. Um, but it was 200 people at the time. In Emily City, Michigan. Yeah, Emily City, and you know, came to a small town, 3,400 people in the town, and um, the church was, give or take, probably strong, 200 people. Um, but uh, they voted me in with a real, real low vote, and uh, but God told me to that I was going to be voted in. How low? It. How low are you? I want to say uh, seventy-three percent. I want to say seventy-three percent. That's pretty low. And uh, so average, you got a C. Yeah, I got it. That was my life. Hey, which for C. you, a C? That's C great. Was I'll right. take it. I take it. Yeah, and that's how I looked at. It. I'm like, hey, I got a C. You know, I if I did that in college, I was happy. But, um, but yeah, basically I did such a great job my first year, 125 people, easy, they left. Uh, so we saw, we were probably 80 people at the time. And so, um, but yeah, we've been here um, 20, 22, or going on 23 years. Mm -hmm. Wow. And uh, now, uh, you know, God has tremendously blessed us. Um, we got four, 54 acres. And, um, you know, on a weekly basis, we run about 1,000, 1,100 people. And, um, and so, but I felt like that first five years was gone out of my life. Like if I would have planted a church, uh, I would have been able to have those five years, you know, to, to establish the foundation yeah. 
I was just surviving the first three to five years. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know. I didn't. I did not even believe that God knew where Emily City existed. What yeah. was, and I know a lot of pastors go through that. And uh, but it was just a very, um, um, very, very, very stressful uh, encounter. If I had to do that over, I probably would have uh, opened the door up and had a lot of people leave. Yeah, I mean, because you say you say you know a thousand people, you know, on a given week. There's probably what a gateway assembly now from the original time you came 20 25. from the original that are with me. No, probably 15 to 20, 15 yeah, to 20, 20 those people uh, original that were with me. And uh, so it's interesting that God called you to take that church yet in a certain sense, you planted a brand new church within yeah. that yeah. building. By my fifth year, it was a plant. It was a brand new church basically. And um, the positive thing about, uh, getting an existing building was that was five hundred thousand dollars we sold it for we yeah. used in the new building yeah and uh, and at the time we had the old building up for sale for nine years and guess when we sold it six months before we came into the new building wow and we needed that five hundred thousand dollars big time so that was the positive the negative was to get through all the 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 old what would you call it old administrative thinking yeah. old uh, it's hard to do a new thing yeah with an old mindset yeah and it so was, you get a lot of people with the old mindset yeah. and you're trying to do a new thing for god such an old mindset uh when i came here but again um uh you know and then when you know 125 people left the first year and that just took the wind right out of me i remember uh, after one year being here, standing before the people and telling the people, we are $25,000 in the hole. Um, and my, my treasurer at the time talked to the people about the finances. And I just uh, said, I don't know how we're going to make it. Uh, Tammy and I were getting ready to get some side jobs. And uh, that's when the people, this is the important part of communication. I did not want to talk to the people because I felt like a failure as a pastor. And I felt like if I talk to the people, I will look like a failure. But after I communicated with the people, that was February. By August, we had $80,000 in the wow. bank. Wow. The That's people, awesome. that, the small little remnant I had at the time, just took that. They started double tithing. Some of them triple tithing. Wow. And... Um, and so God really showed me from that point about communication. That's awesome. Because that, that's a good little like um, teaser. Because in a yeah. couple episodes, they're gonna be able to hear all about vision. Because vision is is huge. Um, man, I could feel the calling on your life. I'm gonna come back to it. And I'm gonna I want to hear from you, Pastor Angela, and we're gonna come right back into this because you got to hang on to that calling during certain seasons. So mm -hmm. for you, um, you received that calling at 24. Yep. You know, you had the journey of, you know, getting to where you are now. Tell me a little bit about that for you. Yeah, I became a youth pastor uh, just just before I was 28 and uh, hung out at that church for about five years. And I just, uh, it was just a stirring, you know. I was, I think what really happened to me, I was just sick and tired of not seeing people come to Christ, you know. Not just at the church I was at, yeah. but even the church I, I got raised in prior to that for eight years, um, and I wanted to win lost people. And so I was always constantly taking my youth group out on the streets to do evangelism. We'd go down to Royal Oak and do dramas on the streets, and I'd preach in between the dramas, and sometimes I'd be in the dramas. Yeah. And um, many times before we'd start doing the dramas or the evangelism, I'd put them on a little prayer walk. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'd come back in about 15 minutes, and we'll start uh, doing the dramas. And it was on one of those prayer walks where I sensed the Lord speaking to my heart. Mm -hmm. And it was something under the effect of, you know, do you want to win lost people? And I'm like, well, yeah, you know I do. And he said, plant a church, wow. you know. And, uh, you know, I'm thinking, I didn't even know that if you plant a church, generally speaking, that's one of the best ways to win lost people. I didn't, I, I never even studied it. I didn't even really know what it was. Now, on, later on, I realized many mission trips that I went on were actually uh, pastors that were planting churches. Yeah. So I, 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 he equipped me a little bit, being able to see some of those initial uh, outreaches and things like that. But it took me four years 
before we actually you know, planted the church. So I get this impression. Uh, now, mind you that I have told my wife numerous times, I mean numerous times, if I ever come to you and tell you I want to be a lead <laughs> pastor or I want to be a you know, senior pastor, I said, punch me in the face. <laughs> and that was our little phrase. And I come home from that Royal Did you Oak. tell her that because you were used to punching coaches in the face? <laughs> so, yeah. I told her that because I saw what a lot of lead pastors go through. Yeah. And I went, I, I know I, I, I can't handle that. There's just no way. Yeah. I'll be an associate all my life kind of a thing. But I came home from that outreach and I sat around the couch. I said, thank God wants us to plant a church. So I'm, you know, I'm ready to block the punch, you know. <laughs> and she's like, let's go for it. Let's go for it. I, I couldn't believe it, you know. So and then again, it took about four years before we actually launched our church. And how did you start it? We started it with a core group, uh, about 12 people in my best friend's basement. I started casting some vision, sharing some core values. Um, and we stayed 12 people for at least three or four months. And then we do these little outreaches and these little dinners. And the 12 turned into 15, 18, 19, 20. And we got to about 25-ish. You know, I didn't really want to launch, but they did. They were getting restless. So we borrowed a little country church in downtown New Baltimore. We started doing Sunday night services there uh, at 5 o'clock. We did that from November till Mother's Day. And on Mother's Day, the church kicked us out. Uh, not rudely. They were just like, you guys need to go. And uh, so from Mother's Day until mid-September, we were homeless. So we relaunched in an old Kroger grocery store on September 22nd, 2002. Wow. Nice. Okay, and tell With me the story. about 35 people, for 30 people. Where are you today? Tell me the story now. What does it look like? Oh, uh, we run about 900 on a Sunday-ish, you know. Um, you rent a building? No, no, no. We've been through numerous uh, building campaigns and building projects. You, you built a, oh, a yeah, facility? We've built, and... Yeah, we've built... Uh, Three times we've done additions and things like that, yeah. It's amazing. You know, hearing you guys already, I know you haven't even fully opened it up up yet here, but you can already hear the hardship, the journey. Everybody wants the, the product, but nobody wants to go through the process. Hello, you know? that's it. Um, according to LifeWay, 250 pastors walk away from the ministry per month. 23% mm -hmm. of them struggle with mental illnesses. And I think the, our listeners today, I think they need to hear about um, the importance of hanging on to the call of God. Because when I hear you guys talk, you know, you have every reason, probably every single one of you, to have given up a whole lot of different times. To throw the towel in, to punch a coach in the face, you know, <laughs> to just... Um, or a prisoner. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, to give up. You know, to give up, especially, you know, you referenced earlier, I know you're joking, but you're saying my numbers before COVID or after COVID, because now here's a brand new journey. We're all on all over again. So can you guys just walk me, tell me what it looks like for somebody listening, either say, you know, I'm 32, they're my age, where they're still young, sort of in their pastoral ministry, and there's still a lot ahead of them, or maybe they've never received the call yet, but they're listening for it. Tell me what it looked like for you guys. You told me kind of like a, a little bit, but you received the call. What does that calling mean to you to the point of, you know, when everyone's leaving in that first five years, why, why are you hanging on to it? Like, what, did, what does it feel like when God finally did something that that calling, each of you in your individual way, stuck with you? Why You finally planted, you stuck with it. You took a church, you stuck with it. You built, you, you go on the streets. Like, why? I would say ultimately I haven't seen the the vision slash dream totally fulfilled yet. So because I haven't seen it fulfilled yet, I know I gotta, I, I know, I know I gotta stick around. That's good. <laughs> you know? But really, I mean, growing up, going through so much heartache, um, you know, again, I talked earlier about just some of the abuse that I experienced in my home with my, with my father and uh, my unteachable spirit. And, and, then, and then you go into ministry and things aren't necessarily opening easy for you, doors aren't flying open. Uh, you, you, you go to plant a church or you want to plant a church, you got to go through four years of red tape and territorialism, and the list goes on and on and on and on. And it was so painful. The stuff that I face as a pastor, as difficult as it is, and there's so many times I want to quit, but because I know I haven't fulfilled what God called me to yet, and the stuff I'm going through in 05, 09, 12, 15, 18, didn't compare to what I went through as a kid, hmm. or even in those four years of, 
you know, uh, not being able to plant or those things that held me back from planting. And it just built muscle, built spiritual muscle to when I began to pastor, as difficult as, as they are, and I think we'll talk about that later in another, in another segment, but it just, it was like, that is tough what I'm going through right now. But it wasn't as bad as what I went through growing up as a kid. It wasn't nearly as bad as those four years of territorialism and, and being called names and stuff like that. And it's just, it, but ultimately it's the dream. It hasn't been fulfilled yet. So what does that so mean? I feel like I got to stick around. God's not done with you. What does that mean? When is it fulfilled? When he called me to plant a church, I knew he wanted me to plant a church that plants churches. Okay. And now it's kind of more multi-siding. Um, and we haven't done that yet. So... So, you know, he just, not he still has yeah, more for you. I know uh, as much as I want to jump ship every now and then, if I'm being honest, I think all of us have been there. I just, we haven't done that yet. So I got to, I know I got to stick around until we do that. <laughs> you it's know? amazing. And, and I hope to do it again and again and again and again and have a movement. Pastor Nate, how about you? Cause you're multi-site now, but I mean, that's not, it's not all about that, but it's a, that's a part of the call in your life and stuff. But what do you keep clinging to? Well, I think it's the mindset as pastors that this isn't our vocation. This is our identity. Hmm. And I know there are some pastors that say, you know, I'm a pastor nine to five, but then I'm not. And I got to separate myself from my church or my calling. And I just don't know how to do that. Hmm. Um, I know pastors say, when God called me into ministry, I hated it. I couldn't believe it, but I submit. And now I'm a pastor. I don't know any of that. When God called me to ministry, that's the most exciting thing that ever happened in my life. I could not believe I was going to college. I could not believe that I wasn't going to have to paint or throw bricks for the rest of my life. I consider it an unbelievable privilege to be chosen by God to help people come to Christ. And so uh, I guess a few days that I had, like when uh, you know our church went through that first hard time when we changed our name, and I thought, man, maybe it's, maybe it's God. You know, we say maybe it's God's time to move on, and he's going to bring somebody else to build off of what I've done. And I... I just remember walking around the, the worship center that Sunday or that Monday or Tuesday being like, I don't know, maybe it's time. And the Lord said, well, if you leave, uh, who's not going to get saved when you're gone? What well, marriage is not going to be healed? Who's not going to be delivered yeah. if, you're here, if you're not here? And uh, I know we don't all bear that, and we can't process everything like that because that's a heavy word. But God called me not to the church because there wasn't a church. He called me to that town, that township, that county. And so uh, I guess the call to that location is what continues me, not just the call to preach, but the call to be uh, uh, to those, those people at Bedford Township, Monroe County, Lucas County. Wow. So that's what kind of kept keeps me going, you know, and... So somebody else is going to get saved, and it's going to be life-changing, and it's going to change generations, genealogies. Like, my kids did not grow up like I did, thank God. Yep. Uh-huh. And their kids will not either. That's good. And uh, I hope my great-grandchildren are sitting around a table someday like this and saying we're third and fourth generation preachers. Amen. Hey, man. That'd be awesome. How about you, Pastor Brad? Yeah, you know, uh, been there 28 years, uh, David. Wow. I would say, yeah, you know, and I think... Um, I saw something not too long ago that said, you know, at your first year one and two, you're kind of a chaplain to people. Year two to five or six, you can be their pastor. And then six and beyond, you get to be their spiritual leader. And that, that really stuck in my head. I think that you look at the guys around the table here and the people that we respect that these guys have been influenced by, my dad, a Wayne Benson, a David Christ, they've been long-term pastors. And to really make an impact on a community, you, you can't be a, a, you know what, there for two years and say, hey, I preached all my messages and I'm down the road. I think that like these guys have spoke about, we fall in love with the community and have a burden for it. And um, I think that that, and I would say as well in the long-term pastorate, uh, Dave, is, um, each one of these guys, your dad was early on, Pastor Jeff. Angelo has gone through some st- stuff in these 18 years. Nate, tw- yeah. 20 years. Brad, 28 years. You're going to go through, I would say to somebody listening, you're going to go through three or four crisis experiences where you're going to be at the fork in the road, and the Lord won't be mad or be um, 
angry towards you or hostile if you were to, to say, okay, he almost gives you an option. I really believe that. Wow. But, but if you'll wow. stay with it um, through that crisis, he'll honor that too. And I, I think we're all testimonies of that. Your dad, there was nothing wrong with he and mother. You know what, uh, early on, if they had gone, the Lord would have still used them. They wouldn't have seen what has happened here happen. Wow. Angelo, the same thing. He got, he, his story is amazing how he got rejected from leadership that uh, wouldn't let him do what was on his heart, but he didn't get embittered. Nate, same thing, going through a church name change, didn't get embittered, just stuck with the stuff. And, you know, Paul writes to the Thessalonians, he says, faithful is he who called you and he will do it. I think for all of us, we come to the place where we just recognize we're instruments, but it's God's work. I yeah. mean, and so you're just careful. And and um, in those three or four crisis experiences long term where you just say, Lord, um, a man that influenced all of us, Wayne Benson, he said, Brad, the safest place to be is out on a limb all by yourself with Jesus. And you come to those places at times in your ministry, you say, Lord. This is, this is only about you, wow. and I'm staying faithful, and he seems to honor that, and I, so kinda, good. I think good. we've all found ourselves that's, in that. That's, that's so good. good. I think the thing I really hear from you is that um, calling a lot of times is about consistency. I believe that. You know, like you said, 28 years, the consistency that that takes to honor that calling, and, uh, you know, Pastor, would you just, like, close this thought right here? Let me rephrase the question a little bit different, too. Why is it so important for someone to understand their calling? You know, we, you know, we hear these numbers of pastors throwing the towel in, um, you know, people just giving up, people not going into ministry. I want to say that the recent number I heard of even, say, youth pastors, I know you guys are, you know, you guys are the real deal, you're senior pastors, I know that, but say even youth pastors. I believe it's 636 youth pastors a year go into youth ministry. Um, we're talking, we're leading a generation of over 40 million students. Okay, so I'm a youth pastor, so this connects with my heart. But only 636 a year are going in. What's the statistic? How many of them stick around in one church for how long? Youth pastors, you know? I don't know the latest stats. I think it's around like what? 18 months maybe? Yeah, it's like a year, yeah, year and a half. Say a year. And then of the 636 that do it, they only even stay there for mm. maybe a year, year and a half. Wow. And then of that you just encourage me i'm doing very well you are you're doing very well even more you know don't even stay in ministry so why is it so important whether someone's listening at a young age or maybe they've been at the same church pounding the ground and they're feeling like man i don't know if i can stick with this anymore why is it so important to know the call you know first of all i echo everything that these three pastors have said I mean each one of them I think we all can relate to uh, because every past senior pastor goes through um, you know the the low highs and lows and most of it a lot of time can be the lows um, but um, but it is a unbelievable pleasure I mean it's just a privilege to be called by God and um, but the I think the, this generation more than ever has to understand the importance of calling. Calling is not throwing out a map and saying, oh, well, that looks like it's more populated over here. And, or, you know, economic uh, status is better over here than over here. So I, I'm going to choose that. That's not, you know, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You know, the prophets of old didn't, you know, do it that way. They went by the calling. God, they were God called to an area. And it's not by what I see on social media. You know, you have a lot of mega uh, examples today on social media that influence the calling. And if that is influencing your calling, I encourage you to get off of social media, get into the word of God and let the Holy Spirit influence your calling. That's good. And when I came here, it was a town, so it was, you know, Emily City is not desirable. Um, this little town of 3,400, I think we're now, the new stats are 3,600. We're 3,600. Hey. 
Hey. And uh, and I never looked at the location. I never ever looked at it. But then I, I just knew there was this fire. It was a fire in my bones. And um, that when I drove on this this little city here for the very first time, I had I just had incredible visions of the possibilities that could happen. And then when you go through the hard times uh, and your calling is tested. Uh, I learned, number one, I, God did not call me here to change this church. God called me here so the church could change Jeff. You know, that's so, it hits, it hits so strong because even... Um, 21 years ago, I, re I remember it like today, um, when God spoke to me because God, God um, knew exactly how Jeff needed to be humbled. He knew exactly how Jeff needed to be like that wine, you know, pressing of the grape, that pressing, that crushing. And I started to, I, and I remember just crying out to God, God, I, I want so desperately to know your calling. I, I want so desperately to dedicate my whole life, my children, my marriage. This is not about what I can get out of it. This is about what I can put into it for your kingdom. And, um, oh, he, he puts you through that crushing, that wine press. Um, and he does it through his church to you. And he started showing me how he was preparing me. He was... Um, molding my calling for this community and um, not not even really understanding what he was going to do in the next 20 years. I just knew I I needed to know his calling for this location. Okay. It wasn't about if it was going to be a bigger church or not or the numbers or it was just about the location because you know dad's always been about souls. I'm just all about souls. Jesus Christ came here for souls. And, uh, and so to really understand my calling, I allowed God to transform me through the church. And he did it. And uh, I tried so much to, to uh, change that scenario, you know, to um, uh, not allow that to happen. But... Um, when God spoke that word to me so strong, I embraced the crushing of the grape. I embraced the 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 wine press, and uh, uh, and and you know, I in the little parsonage that we were at, I put up uh, sheets from my little prayer room in in the basement, uh, and um, I had some incredible crying out days to God. And uh, but the calling, I knew the calling because I wanted to not be a statistic. I wanted to be a lifetime here. That's good. Amen. People want a new thing. People want the new wine, but they don't want the crushing necessary to yeah. get it. You know, and I, th I think that's so good. The thing that as I just hear you guys speak that just resonates with me so strong is that the same voice that flung the stars into space is the same voice that called us each into ministry. Yeah. And uh, it is a privilege. I pray that people today would be so blessed by what you said, challenged. I think we need to be challenged. I think I'm um, encouraged. Can I say something? Yeah, absolutely. I think I'm supposed to say something, Dave. Uh, I got saved because somebody said, hey, did you ever think about getting saved? Mm -hmm. I went to ministry because somebody said, you ever think you, you should be a pastor? I became a church planner because somebody said, do you ever think you should become a church planner? I think it's our roles for the next generation to put the, because I couldn't pray about it until I was presented with it. Right. And I think we never want to forget that there are young people like us. There are 16 and 17 and 18 and 20 year olds sitting thinking, I'll just try to get a job and make it. That if we say to them, did you ever pray about, do you ever think about being a pastor, being called? 
I think more people are going to join those ranks. Wow. Well said. So we need more churches planted our nation. Amen. Amen. Needs, our world needs more missionaries. We need more, more men and women called to God. Amen. That's so good. Pastor, will you pray over people Amen. listening, watching right now? Uh, pray over their calling. Lord, right now we just come to you, and God, we just thank you for this awesome opportunity that all of us have that have been called, have been, Lord, just chosen for such a time as this, yes. dear God. And Lord, that pastor, that pastor's wife, that missionary, that evangelist, whoever it may be, that, that staff person, dear Jesus, dear God, that they're struggling right now in their situation. God, it's, it's a... Many times it's a spiritual dark situation. God, it's bringing emotional depression. Lord, all of us have gone through that. Lord, your your prophets have gone through that of old. Elijah, wanted, Elijah did not want to live on this earth any longer. God, you understand those emotions. And so, Lord, right now, I just we we just bind our hearts together and we pray. Dear Father, for that pastor, for that individual that is in ministry right now, and they're ready to, yeah, them, they're ready to just, them, Father, uh, throw it in. They're ready to just to quit. And dear God, right now we pray that they, they have a, an extra boldness. Their Lord, a fire that's shut up in their bones, they can't contain it. And their Lord, right now, they just got to let it out. God, give them wisdom. Give them a strength. Give them endurance to stand up against the enemy right now, against the darkness. And, Lord, that darkness that's been talking to them, Lord, they get up and start talking back yes. to that darkness yes. and tell that darkness where to go back to where it came from. And, God, because, God, they have been called. They have been called. And, dear Lord, if it might be that one for that day, if it might be two for that week, Whatever it may be, they're called to people, dear God. And so, Lord, we just pray that upon them, that they don't lose out, but they're encouraged. They're encouraged to stay with the stuff and that they start having the flow of vision, the flow of dreaming again. And dear Lord, God, it's, it's that they even might get off of social media for a time if it starts bothering them. They might stop looking at other ministries if it starts to bother them. And they just get down on their knees, get down on their face, and hear your calling again. Hear what you have for them, dear Jesus, because you want us. You have called us all to dream, to have visions, and to do the impossible for you, dear God. We just pray that upon these individuals right now in your name. And we all said, Amen. 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 Amen.